I would like to welcome Lieutenant General B K Alwale, Director Claus, and Lieutenant General Rakesh Sharma, a distinguished fellow Claus, to discuss on a very pertinent topic that is India-China, Doklam to Galwan and beyond. Uh, as we know, this is apart from COVID-19. It is the tension of the India-China border that is also the most topical issue and the most debated issue worldwide. Not just limited to India and China, but there are crystal games happening worldwide because it is an important concern strategically to every stakeholder in the region, be it US or Japan or any of the major countries. So none other than both the core commanders who serve the 14 core are the best to have their uh, to share their opinions and insight on this issue. But before we start off, I would like to give a primer that why are we discussing and why this dispute? As we know that India and China share a disputed territory of 3,488 kilometer, which remains disputed at uh, three sectors: eastern sector, which comprises of Sikkim and Arunachal Pradesh. Middle sector that comprises of Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand, and finally Western sector that comprises of Eastern Ladakh. In since May, we see the Chinese transgressions being apparent first in Sikkim, then finally Eastern Ladakh. Unlike the past, this time we see that China simultaneously activated two sectors at the same time. So there is a lot of change and shifts in Chinese behavior. If we look back, that is the earlier period of standoffs and Doklam and now at Galwan. So giving this uh, against this background, I would now like to uh, ask Lieutenant General VK Alwale to give his understanding of how does he see this change uh, in Chinese behavior, the trajectory as in terms of the trajectory of Chinese actions, as well as the behavior of Chinese uh, actions and transgressions along the disputed line of actual control. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Lieutenant General Aluwalia to give his views on the issue now. Uh, thank you, Amrita. Uh, the subject is quite complex. Some portion you already have stated, but allow me to give you some very basic facts to reinforce what you have already said. The seeds of conflict or the India-China boundary dispute were sown when People's Republic of China annexed Tibet in 1950-51. The border, as you mentioned, is 3,488 kilometers and has three distinct sectors. The western sector is 826 kilometers. Now, this is also called the line of actual control. A line of actual control is neither delineated on the map, nor is it demarcated on the ground. Hence, it results in different perception between both the sides, that is India and China. As a result of which, we have seen that over the years, there have been routine transgressions across the line of actual control, the LAC, to their lines of perceptions. A number of occasions, these resulted in the mill standoffs. And these standoffs were called off at the local levels. I also want to make a mention that over the years, since 1993 to 2013, India and China have had five major agreements and protocols. These are pertaining to the confident building measures, border management protocols, joint working mechanisms. And you find that because of this, there has been really speaking no firing across this long 3,488 kilometers of border. But now, since early May, that is 5th of May this year, there has been a distinct change. We find that the Chinese People's Liberation Army 
came with a much greater force level opposite the eastern ladakh and transgressed at a few select places as a result of which there was a military standoff also you find that this time that they contacted the line of actual control at not one point but at about four to five points also there was a build up immediately thereafter in terms of larger number of uh, force levels also tanks artillery guns air defense systems aircraft being uh, positioned in the air bases as also radars so this was unique in some form that this particular movement of the pla took place as a result of a decision given at a strategic level it was not a decision taken at a local level what is more disturbing was that at this time there were physical violence which resulted in injuries to both the sides consequent to the dialogue between the core commanders on the 6th of june and the follow up taken up by our own force of the indian forces on 15th of june there was a breach of trust displayed by the chinese forces which they attacked the indian uh, troops who had gone to verify the disengagement process as a result of which 20 indian soldiers got killed and an equal number and more which have not been confirmed by the chinese authorities also were the casualties on china's side my point is very simple that why did this really happen certainly it was a decision taken at a higher level let me say the aim while i would say that pla had multiple aims but since we are talking about eastern ladakh at the moment let me very briefly very briefly give you the strategic significance of eastern ladakh eastern ladakh is a sharp wedge between gilgit baltistan on the west and aksai chin on the east as also to find that their security personnel of the china in the gilgit baltistan region in addition to that to the north of dolat beg old dbo is the karokaram pass which is just about 16 kilometers from dbo there lies the strategic areas and sensitive areas of china in the xinjiang region as also the strategic highways so i would say that consequent to this kind of violence and the breach of trust what is the net result there is a huge trust deficit also it has resulted in uh, sentiments being against china but there is a positive part to this and the positive part is that both the countries feel that we must continue to engage and maintain a dialogue with a view to disengage and deescalate there have been three uh, core commander level military commander level meeting that has been held there have been a diplomatic engagement that is taking place also there has been a communication between the special representatives of both the countries i think that is one positive part that we are now trying to disengage and deescalate the situation primarily to restore the status quo anti thank you very much sir uh, as i get the impression the few key takeaways that i get is firstly galwan was not a regular phenomena it was rather unique and what makes it made it distinct was the violence scuffle so all this while the long touted uh, theory that not a single fire shot comes to an end with this violence scuffle but not a fire shot but the violence scuffle resulting into casualties now drawing from this i would like to ask general sharma that sir how do you then see this change of pattern from doklam to galwan doklam was also unique in a tri junction and then galwan was is unique in its own form taking the level of conflict to that of a level of violence so i would like to ask you sir how do you read this transition in chinese behavior what what is the chinese mindset the thinking and you know how do you see this change of pattern 
after just you know after 2017 july we see a similar pattern in 15th june 2020 your views on this sir uh, thank you amrita and nice of you to call me to discuss this issue uh, there are about a million people nowadays who are speaking and writing on this issue so we join in among the million people there uh, the fact is that i'll take a step back a step a little back from 2017 since the time the current president came in ji jinping uh, you see there used to be a philosophy of hiding your strength and biding your time you would have heard those deng xiaoping speeches but when uh, uh, ji jinping came into the fort he uh, created another epitaph which uh, uh, a dialogue which said testing your resolve or checking your resolve so he has transited from biding your time to testing of resolve in the time it took over that's about 7 8 years ago and you know that testing of resolve i think it started in those years 2012 13 14 till date and there were small 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 instances happening not all against us some in south china sea some in senkaku islands or you know uh, uh, against uh, nantanu sea in in indonesia so they were even building up to he was testing resolve of all countries in a distinct pattern from 2013 onwards including us he tried in 2013 in rakinala and and the wai junction he tried tumor in 2014 2017 he tested a resolve in a tri junction which was mutni centuries hoping that we will not respond to uh, to that issue but you know in testing of resolve finally when he came to 2020 and he had the pressure of covid and all of the pressure combined together and then you also add on to other issues see his economy changed it changed from low cost manufacturing to innovative uh, production now he his country transited to making sophisticated items and not low cost low cost toys his trade surpluses came up largely from many countries his thing of bri you know he is not earned um the soft part but he has earned a large number of countries grudging support because he literally pumped in so much of money in africa and latin america that he has now a number of countries that will support him so he built the whole issue together the economics he built up his trade issues his bri issues or obor as we call it and you know all this was adding on and adding on to 2020 this i think covid came in as a little shock to him also but the fact is that uh, this is 100 year 100th year of communist party starting this month communist party from the ccp which actually runs the everything is finishing 100 years in july 2021 and you know this 2020 was a timeline he had laid to himself in the modernization of the military saying the first timeline will be 2020 when the military will come to a level and his, his modernization military also was a very very focused affair so i would count that you know this is a test bed a test time 2020 he gave himself a testing time as to where is he received and in the testing time uh, i would not say galwan was as important or pegongso was important or depsan or demcho i say it is the event was important this event added on to the events which have happened elsewhere which were pre planned or see uh, the the exercises started in january february march covid was just about coming up in january february so he planned the whole situation in the manner that it would build up he didn't stop the events going because the covid came in covid was incidental and of course major issue but now he brought it into the sparse of this time i would guess sir before i end here i would guess is that before he did galwan and before he did pigong so he brought those two divisions down he was scared of the response the indian would do so he protected his back he put the two divisions in the back and then he tested any fool will know the minute you come to finger four of the gong so indian army will react violently because finger eight tak we have been going so regularly so you know it was a issue galwan was a untested waters galwan nobody had gone so i think it was a very well planned and very well executed maneuver only thing that went wrong was that the response that we found from the indian side was exceedingly robust and the robust response is what jang alwal is referred to is what we will talk, talk here after thank you very much sir as i take uh, from your say that you know it was uh, testing uh, india's resolve at the untested waters that is galwan 
and uh, china again burnt its hand similar to that of doklam means that they didn't learn their lessons from doklam and they tried to again push ahead the security envelope at galwan but again they fell flat so the situations are very interesting the timing is very interesting of why now and why galwan partially sir you have already uh, answered Untested uh, waters. So now, from this point, I would uh, like to ask General Aluwalia. It's a what, in your opinion, when the entire world is uh, global uh, shaming China on Wuhan epidemic because from Wuhan epidemic, this virus outbreak transformed in that uh, to that of a pandemic. So we cannot outlaw that fact. and against this how could in uh, china afford to uh, do an immediate adventure with its uh, neighbor not just india and also other flash points it has activated but india is something which is uh, most prominent so my very pointed question to you sir why galwan and why now because you already Uh, drawn enough criticism from uh, the globe at large so how does it add it just damages further your take away sir again amrita uh, some portions of this had been uh, covered by general sharma but i would like to cover this in two parts one is a bigger picture as we see and second is what has been china's strategy i'll cover these two important part but about last year I read a wonderful article by one Mr. Michael Beckley, an assistant professor of political science, and the gist of what he said was that historically, whenever rising powers have suffered economic slowdown, they have it has resulted in their being repressive at home and aggressive abroad. This is most apt. by china today and why am i saying that i am saying that because over the last few years progressively there has been a sharp decline in the economic growth of china from 15% gdp growth rate to just about 1% as projected by international monetary fund for 2020 from 15% gdp growth rate to about 1% is a huge decline in the economic uh, growth of a country along with it you have a huge unemployment rate in the country you also find as jal sharma mentioned that china has been has adopted the policy of from being assertiveness to aggressiveness they have been aggressive in south china sea with the number of stakeholders like vietnam malaysia indonesia philippines brunei in the east china sea with japan as the senkaku island as across the taiwan strait with taiwan has also unrest in hong kong with the national security law being uh, given out by the chinese all this has actually put a great amount of pressure on china the second part is the china has indulged in what is known as predominantly capturing or reclaiming certain areas on the periphery of china which means south china sea has also on the india china border they have tried to reclaim or capture additional areas with a view not to use force or not fire a shot this is what they have tried to do so therefore i think china actually has faced a large number of um, challenges both at home and outside of china and this is what they have tried to achieve by coercion and intimidation but this time i think the strategy went wrong so what is the aim i only made a mention in a very passing manner in the first part i think he had multiple aims first aim of china was to send a message to the own population and to the world community at large that despite the number of challenges that it faces it stands tall it stands strong and that it is not deterred by any of these challenges the general message that is 
aspiring superpower of making to the world at large. Second one, as far as Eastern Ladakh is concerned, the endeavor of China has been to realign the LAC, the line of actual control, with a view to achieve strategic and operational advantage. You all are aware that uh, we have built a 255 kilometer long strategic road from Darbuk, Shok to DBO. And DBO is at a height of 16,600 feet, just about 16 kilometers short of Karakaram Pass. Therefore, I think China has been apprehensive, has certain amount of fears about our developing strategic assets or infrastructure close to the LSC. But I think I'll cover the rest of the part later. Uh, so in my readings, uh, as you said, that China was trying to send a message, uh, not just to its own people, but also a message across, if I may uh, paraphrase it, that to the globe at large and to its adversaries in particular. But I think so, there, it has catapulted certain actions. We see that China's push against India has made many major powers come closer to India. We see there is a huge American response that they are shifting, they are thinking of shifting their forces out of NATO. We see France, we see even Russia backing India. So on this note, sir, I would I'd like to ask General Sharma, how do you then see these changes? Sir? We are, we can argue that, you know, this is, can be a push factor, which is resulting into U.S. getting back, a, a, you know, a re-pivot back to Asia we are seeing in terms of U.S. thinking. Your understanding of it, sir. Okay, uh, you have gone back into history and President Obama's time talking about uh, pivot. The pivot actually died uh, about five, six years ago. And um, as the events have shown, the United States uh, largely showed uh, uh, inwardness, you know, uh, America first feeling where their troops are being withdrawn from, say, Iraq or Syria or, um, uh, I mean, uh, Afghanistan. And now you said Germany. So there was a feel that way that America is moving more inwards. And, you know, this has been stated by the President of the United States a number of times that we move backwards. He did not come out overtly in support of Article 5 of the NATO, which was support. So there was a transition happening. A transition happening in which the global monitor, so if I may say so, was feeling more and more um, inward looking. And that cause was causing a little bit of overconfidence in China saying that, okay, America has got major problems uh, at home. And then, you know, they have election year, which is a great jamboree that they have in the United States on election year. So all this is, I mean, this is the right time to do so. And, uh, but I agree with you in saying that, Amrita, that this, uh, the response that came across globally was was tremendous. Most of these country has a large relationship with China. Australia has great relationship with China in form of barley or beef, and you know, 50% of their tourists. Most of these country earn tremendous amount of money because of Chinese students. The student from China or India pay double the cost when they go across. So all this was, you know, um, he thought that people will be reactive. It will be understanding of the money that is being pumped in China. But the response has been contrary, which actually brings out great geopolitics around. The, the geopolitics of the world still says that look, nobody can be so overpowering in nature that you try and take, uh, you know, show eyes to line number of countries. So I think uh, the global committee has uh, nations, despite that, you know, we used to talk uh, global disorder. The, despite the global disorder, there has been a committee of nations which came together to hold on to China. The robustness of the international response has been tremendous. You know, so I uh, I would say, and of course, many countries like Russia. Russia has good relationship with China. They have huge pipelines in uh, supplying oil across to, uh, to China. But still, they had a very embedded in, and despite the elections that the Chinese uh, Russians are having, they had a very bedded in and a sober response to, to all this. And despite that, you know, in, you know, India looks closer to United States and Russia, but Russian response has been very measured and very good. So I would say that uh, if it is testing waters, then there is a lot for the Chinese government to learn. It may be internal issues 
since he wanted ultra nationalism that was tried to brought, uh, bring about but ultra nationalism apart the committee of nations has got together like never before and it stands out that they, they would be uh, uh, understand hopefully they be understanding in china i want to discuss about why galwan and pagong so whenever you give me a time yes sir you can you can take this up okay thank you amita see the question is of all this area that we have 1000 odd kilometers on eastern ladakh galwan is the only place he didn't have a road to the lac he has constructed roads he didn't have a road to chumar he constructed in 1314 he has brought the road up to chumar the lac all other places up to what he thinks is his lac he has constructed roads and metal roads largely galwan is the only uh, valley which is 80 km long valley where he doesn't have a road from that side of saichin and coming up closer to the lac and then second is galwan was okay he never ventured in here we were patrolling we were patrolling regularly but chinese have never ventured into galwan at least there have been no face off no meetings at all so this was opening a new front he was probably protecting himself also for the road that we have constructed and also targeting a road so while constructing a road he also targeted a road so it was many fold i think a very wise uh, uh, you know objective chosen by the chinese they wanted to construct a road and target our highway and the feeder we were building so i think galwan was very nicely planned and the other issue was uh, pegongso so pegongso you know even 2017 you referred to doklam doklam and doklam was happening there was guttam guta there were fist cuffs and fights at pegongso at the same place of finger 4 and 5 in 2017 so you know he knew that we would be very strongly reactive to anything which happens at pegongso finger 4 we won't be able to Uh, you know resist taking action in this one so both the areas is selected a uh, very um, uh, you know well thought about and keenly done that's how we have been doing face off regularly them chalk it happens regularly it is one more thing but this one i think nicely done and he has come and you know look at the mirror response we is calling it mirror response look at the robustness of our response in galwan in pegongso including from the from the reserve formation that were brought into the area acclimatized and available to us for action i think we had shown the metal that we are made of so as i gather from both your uh, perceptions uh, and thought process having been served there and you know re- reading then and now there's one thing that can be strongly argued that we uh, indian the indian forces did unnerve china china has been taken aback and shocked and also i would like to add that you know the way indian army has been rapidly uh, building its own infrastructure that was also one of the causal factors that you know that took china by surprise so it has a capable army to fight against so that is these are some of the realities that are out in open so again the this backdrop so it's not just a bilateral issue anymore we are seeing a a multifarious of uh, uh, you know uh, the uh, a multi uh, multitude of factors that are coming into play with worldwide attention to india china given both our rising powers and both are here to define the much called asian century so uh, in the wrap up i would just like to ask both of you that uh, what then should be india's understanding of china now onwards and more precisely how do you see a shift both in the indian mindset and policy making towards china from galwan as we crystal gaze a way forward uh beyond galwan so here i would like to first go with general sharma and then finally wrap with general alwalia's final takeaways on the issue okay uh, uh let me start this way that china is a global power it has a gdp which is very large you know five six seven times of our gdp it's got a very strong military so you know you can't write away china did china achieve its objectives what he started when he came towards eastern ladakh 
as he achieved his objective or his objective stands nullified. If his objective stand nullified, he has to respond to his uh, nation, to his people, saying that they came out with a bad face. That will be for a rising superpower and a, uh, and a nation dependent upon their own uh, military and the own Communist Party will not be acceptable. So to say that all this is finished and nothing is going to happen hereafter, I think that will be myopic thinking. We have to be prepared for his phase two. The phase two, whether he'll come on this border or come somewhere else or some other form is not important today. But we must anticipate a phase two. That's my first point. The second point is that obviously that the protocols that General Aluwalia was referring to, the CBMs that we were signed, the banner drills we had, the BPMs, finally speaking, all those protocols have failed. It actually proves it that the LSC itself was a flawed concept. It was not a concept on which uh, nations actually decide to manage boundaries. Because, you know, when you, you say LSE 1993, but you don't demark it, if you don't delineate the LSE, how do you expect that LSE to be monitored? So the LSE was absolutely for flawed concept. Now, with the absence of trust totally, I think we'll have to revise our rules of engagement, our management of the LC, our uh, belief in that, you know, these areas may be disputed and he will not come and sit there. He's done so in Pegong, so then larger number of areas, you know, even in the Northeast, say, uh, fish tails or the areas of Kimutumurong or many other areas across, we will be conscious of the fact that he, if he's done in Pegong, so he can do somewhere else. The changes are posture, that patrolling may not be successful venture hereafter. And second is, a third is that, you know, in the rules of engagement, we know that this is a devious and a cunning enemy. He will bring about a weapon which looks so beautiful, tied up with nails and things like that. You know, uh, we don't carry weapons. We have only our weapon to carry. We don't carry dandas. It's not part of our culture. We have to be prepared next time. Next unit which gets into involved in an event like this cannot be told, okay, you, you know, you can't use a weapon because the unit will say it's not done. I'm not accepting casualties. That changes the whole concept of management, border management posture of the line of actual control. And the last issue I want to raise is conventional. See, to threaten us, he brought three divisions, or two and a half, three divisions, whatever. I know we don't know the facts of the case. And he brought them down from the other side of Kunlun Mountains to opposite our areas. It's a threat in being. We have to plan our posture. Now, we can't depend in the winter months, say, to say that we'll bring forces from, from planes of males, we won't be able to do so. So we have to plan our posture in a manner that we have resilience in, in management of the Eastern Ladakh and other areas, even in months where the roads are cut off. So the whole gamut of management in water management posture as also conventional wars, we have to be re-examined by us. Thank you, sir. And uh, before I start with uh, General Aluwalia, I would like to point out that General Aluwalia in his recent article, he had recommended uh, uh, demilitarization of two kilometers. And we see a resonance to that in our current uh, withdrawal of troops. Uh, compliments to you, sir, on that. And I would now uh, ask you to wrap up that what should be the India, uh, India stand thinking and uh, what should, in your view should be the way forward over to you just before that let me just give you that there are basically four major points which the pla touched or came in contact with one is the finger area as general rakesh sharma mentioned north of that is an area called hot spring and to the north of that is the area called galwan valley now in relation to what he said after 1962 Till the 5th of May this year, China never laid any claim in the Galwan Valley. This was another unique uh, facet of this engagement, that they laid claims to areas which they never laid claim since 1962, primarily because they are actually apprehensive of our strategic highway which has come up up to the DBO. And the fourth point was in the area of Asha. This is what I thought I will just tell you now. 
I would say that what is the major irritant between India and China? We are doing trade, but the major irritant between India and China is our border dispute. Where have we reached over the last seven decades? Despite all the agreements, despite all the protocols, special representative dialogues, we find that over the last 70 years, we have not been able to make any real practical gains or net result on a on our boundary dispute to be resolved. Therefore, it gives an impression that China is not interested in settling the India-China boundary dispute. Why the reason is simple, they would like India to remain embroiled in this boundary dispute both with Pakistan and China and that we do not uh, focus on the comprehensive national power. Our economic growth is also to look at Indian Ocean region, which is the uh, battleground of the future. So this is one aspect that we need to take to, uh, to make a note of. Other issue is, well, in addition to what General Rakesh Sharma said, I would say that this is time now to carry out a review of our policies, whether political, economic, uh, militarily, or diplomatic as also the other instrumental national power must carry out a review of our policies with China. Also the fact, during this period we saw China indulging in a huge information warfare campaign. Propaganda, psychological, fake news, I would say misinformation, with a, with a view to show that they have done a build-up, a large force structure, Therefore, India also needs to have a media strategy to counter such narratives of the adversaries. Third, I would like to mention deterrence is a function of two major factors. One is the capability and second is the resolve. We need to address both. Capability, we need to develop soft, hard and demonstrated power so that we are capable enough, not that we are not capable today, we are, but we need to further improve our capabilities. And therefore, I would feel that there is a requirement of having a look at two important facets. What do we require in the immediate future? What do we require in the long term? In the immediate future, now I would say our endeavor is to ensure we restore the status quo and time continue with the disengagement and de-escalation process and achieve status quo and time. At the same time, they, we should not be lulled into a sense of complacency, not only in this sector, also in the other sectors like the middle sector and the eastern sector. And we must continue to build our technology-enabled military capabilities and continue to build our infrastructure uh, along the borders carry out border, border area development as we are thought out to be, as also in the long term, our endeavor should be to ensure that we try and resolve the boundary dispute with China, get the maps to be delineated and demarked on the ground. I think some of these require a reshaping of our policies at the highest level. And I'm sure we have the capability and we will have the potential to emerge as a global power. Thank you very much, sir. I would like to uh, uh, wind up this podcast on few key takeaways, uh, drawing from uh, both uh, of your insights and uh, recommendations. Firstly, that uh, as China tried to message, India to send a message, not just symbolic, but significant, that reiteration <coughs> that China gives that, you know, we are a China of today, so that Ch so as well, China got to learn that India today is not the India of 1962. India is militarily prepared, and as drawing from Prime Minister Modi's recent visit, he said that no to new kind of expansionism. So I think so. China too has got its message very well, and as you rightly pointed out, sir, that it's the right opportunity that we enhance 
our prepared days and also up the rapidify the process of boundary settlement though we are dealing with an adversary whose intentions are clear and straight it serves its interest not to serve solve the border dispute but india on the other hand we should push it ahead because we are strong on in our resolve on that note sir i would like to thank both uh, general walia and general sharma for giving uh, their insights and their time thank you very much thank you amrita thank, thank you, you very much thank you sir thank you thank you rakesh thank you sir okay take care thank you <laughs> bye bye right, we call off now yes sir